people are still marveling in a in a disappointed kind of way uh, about the fact that so many experts were wrong about uh, the global economy and especially how to fix it in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Our next guest has written a book on that very topic entitled Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. Mark Weisbrot is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research here in Washington, D.C. He is an economist, among other things. He is the co-author with Dean Baker of the, of the book Social Security, the Phony Crisis, and he joins us now. Mark, thanks for coming on the program. Sure. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. Now, just uh, tell us briefly, if you would, uh, what Failed is all about. Well, it's about, as the title implies, it's about long-term economic failures and what causes them and how they can be uh, reversed. So, for example, there's two chapters on the Eurozone, which today has twice the unemployment uh, rate of the United States, even though the United States was kind of the epicenter of the financial crisis and world recession of 2009. And then it looks also at uh, the long-term failure in developing countries in the last two uh, decades of the 20th century, and especially in Latin America. And it also looks at the International Monetary Fund, which had a huge role in uh, really all of these failures. And also on the positive side, uh, lost most of its uh, power uh, over developing countries uh, in the 21st century. So if we go back, let's say 40 years, uh, may, uh, I, I'm not sure my chronology may be off by a decade or two, but if we go off, let's say, 40 years, uh, uh, we I, I would assume that the field of economics uh, had some fairly well-established beliefs, beliefs that had been seem to have been confirmed by what happened after the Great Depression, beliefs that seem to have been confirmed by the rate of growth after World War II, which said that, you know, there are times when government intervention, government spending is very uh, is a very positive factor in economic growth. Uh, the, the notion of uh, job creation, what it took to sustain a healthy uh, uh, labor market and so on. Uh, these things seem to be fairly well decided, and maybe I'm getting my chronology wrong, but it seems that over the last 40 years or so, a new kind of conventional wisdom arose that was based on austerity, on cutting, giving primacy to cutting government spending, and that, that seemed to drive a, a lot of the behavior of uh, a lot of the institutions you're describing. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Well, it, it is. I mean, it does capture a part of it, which is that, and, and it's a part that I don't really write about much in the book, and that is how you know, the economics profession uh, did change. It was uh, much more uh, Keynesian. Uh, that is, it, it held the beliefs that you uh, described, that there was an important role that, uh, for government to revive economies that wouldn't necessarily adjust by themselves when they were caught in, in recession, for example. And then there was this kind of a right-wing uh, counter-revolution in economics in uh, the you know second half of the post-World War II period. But I think that uh, a lot of what we're witnessing today is not so much about that uh, struggle within the economics profession. For example, in the Eurozone, I would say probably a, a, a large number and maybe even majority of economists would say that those policies are wrong, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that they would recognize that one of the reasons that, or the main reason even that the Eurozone has uh, such high unemployment right now is, is because of these uh, policies. Uh, so, you know, when Paul Krugman writes about that in the New York Times, for example, uh, he's definitely not alone in the profession. He's, he's not, a, he doesn't have you know, 100 percent economists on his side, but he might very well have a majority. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, if you look at it, you, you know, it, the failures we're looking at are, are different in, in different countries and different places. And sometimes the institutions are very important. Um, so, you know, if you look at, compare the United States to Europe, that would be a good comparison. As I said, you know, here they have twice the unemployment rate that we do. Uh, you know, seven, uh, six years 
uh, after seven years after the Great Re Recession. Why is that? Well, one of the big institutional differences is, is that uh, they have the Eurozone. That is, they have a number of countries who do not have control over their most important economic uh, policies, uh, including uh, exchange rate uh, policy, uh, because they don't control the currency, monetary and interest rate, including interest rate policies. And uh, then when they got in trouble, they found out they didn't have control over their fiscal policy, that the European authorities uh, had that. So they gave up their sovereignty uh, over the most important economic policies. They gave it to these institutions, and they gave it to institutions that really didn't have, were, were completely unaccountable to their electorates in Spain and Greece and Ireland and Portugal, uh, and uh, even France is affected by this. Um, and this was, I think, a big mistake. And this is one of the things that this is a, a, one of the themes of the book, too, that, that, you know, sovereignty, national sovereignty over economic policy is very important. And if you're going to cede some of that for some reason to say to join the IMF or the World Bank, or you want to do something collectively and internationally about climate change, for example, it's going to be necessary to give up some sovereignty there. You just want to be careful about not giving it to people, who the, the wrong people. You know, if, if Mitt Romney had been elected in the United States, for example, you know, he would not have done anything like the Eurozone uh, governments did because he would want to be reelected. And yet in Europe, more than 20 governments have fallen uh, since the uh, world recession because they were forced to do things that people would never vote for. So that's one, one uh, I think, one of the causes that people overlook. And it's probably because they don't understand what's really happening uh, in the Eurozone. Well, let's or, talk. Uh, yeah, let me let's talk about that for a second. We're talking with Mark Weisbrot, author of the book Failed. So, okay, and the, I, I understand that in the eurozone, people gave up control over a large part of their monetary policy uh, to join, including their currency. Extreme case, of course, being Greece uh, and what's going on there, and the the uh, draconian conditions that have been imposed on the people there, on them economically, even democratically, as I understand that the Greek parliament now has to get approval before releasing draft versions of bills even uh, from from uh, uh, the Troika or some some variation thereof. But but uh, I, I guess the question I, I would ask you, Mark, is uh, to what extent, why do the experts in the Eurozone continue to pr impose policies that, you know, you mentioned austerity, you know, government spending cutbacks that are worsening the economic situation there, even worsening, as we understand, the deficits that they're meant to reduce. Uh, you have, um, we could get into central bank policy as well, but uh, so why do they persist in, in imposing these policies if they are harmful? Yes, well, that is one of the uh, questions that this book tries to answer in the chapters on the Eurozone. And the, I think the uh, short answer is that these European authorities, you can call them the Troika, although you could also include it, and so the Troika would include the um, European Commission, the European Central Bank, um, and the, the IMF, but you would also include the Eurogroup of Finance Ministers, for example. Um, and they, uh, they have a political agenda. And their agenda is to transform Europe into something, they're not gonna ever make it like the United States with the kind of you know, uh, poverty levels that we have here, for example. Um, but they want it to be a more unequal society where labor has uh, less influence and bargaining power, where uh, there's Pensions are smaller, public pensions, uh, health care spending is cut, public employment is less, the state is, is smaller overall. Um, those are the things, and, and the, the way I show this in the book is we, we looked at these uh, agreements. Where, so you have a paper trail for this, this isn't just speculation. You have, um, for example, we looked at 
between 2008 and 2011, so that's four years, including the crisis years. You have Article 4, 67 Article 4 agreements. Now, those are papers that each member of government is a member of the IMF, uh, is required to do jointly with the IMF, where they look at the economy and they make recommendations. And those were the recommendations you saw uh, in these agreements overwhelmingly, cut pensions, cut health care spending, uh, reduce eligibility for unemployment insurance, uh, reduce the bargaining power of labor by changing labor laws they did in Spain and Greece, and they've tried to do now in Italy. So this is really, they're trying to uh, transform these countries, and they used the crisis, and they actually prolonged it. Uh, that's one of the things uh, that I show, is that they could have had, like we did, you know, we had a serious recession, but it was only 18 months, and then the economy started to grow again. And they had a similar length recession in Europe, but then uh, they went back into recession for another two years. And that was, uh, in large part, it was due to the austerity, but it was also due to the financial crisis that was brought on uh, by the European Central Bank refusing to do what uh, central banks do, which is to backstop the bonds in the Eurozone area, like, you know, in the United States, where our Federal Reserve, of course, engaged uh, in quantitative easing and immediately uh, lowered interest rates to zero and made sure that they would do whatever they could uh, to make sure there wasn't a crisis here like you had an, an additional crisis, uh, like you had in Europe. So that's the thing. It is really about policy. And all of these things are, are very often uh, about policy and about uh, well, policy well, that's widely misunderstood. So maybe this gets into why the word experts is in quotes in your subtitle, what the experts got wrong about the global economy. Is this really about technical experts getting things wrong, or is it really about some of these uh, multinational institutions having more of a political or ideological and perhaps even corporate agenda than, in other words, is this really a matter of failure of expertise, or is it really a matter of uh, other agendas being presented as, as technical solutions? Well, uh, I think it is, it's both of those. Um, I think the, there are a lot of real experts involved in it. Uh, these are economists. Although, you know, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, I remember he complained publicly uh, when he was in the meeting of the Eurogroup of finance ministers. And he was fighting, he was the you know, finance minister of Greece during the negotiations and he was fighting for Greece. And, he complained that half of the or most of these people were not even economists, that they were lawyers and they couldn't, you know, even understand what was at stake. And in Greece, for example, how much, you know, how the economy really would shrink uh, if they carried out the austerity policies that they were proposing. So there's a certain amount of incompetence there as well. Uh, and you do, I think I put experts in quote because um, these policies and these mistakes and these wrong policies and the brutalization of these economies, not only in Europe, but in developing countries where it's even much worse, you know, it depends on some sort of public acceptance. And that is the result of people who, who talk to a mass audience, people in the media, politicians, and uh, people who are not experts but think they have a theory, like in the United States, for example, where, you know, all these people, including politicians and uh, pundits, think that we have to worry about the national debt, which is completely ridiculous. And uh, so uh, that, uh, so in that sense, those people are not experts. Yeah, I, I, I and apparently uh, there's a, a systemic breakdown in the in the, I'm I'm thinking, for example, of you know even in the IMF, Olivier Blanchard, I think was their chief economist, right? Um, yeah. 
he seemed to, you know, offer some some discussion papers that were seemed quite sound and reasonable. But somewhere along the line, the mechanism, uh, he was not the decisive voice in all of this. Um, I guess I, w- I would, we're running short on time. I, I, I guess I might conclude, uh, wrap it up by saying uh, we've done better here. We could do better clearly than we are doing in terms of employment, labor force participation, and so on. Our own central bank, the Federal Reserve, appears poised to raise interest rates uh, sometime this month, sometime in December. Uh, If that happens, are they making a small version of a European-style mistake? Oh, absolutely. I think it is a mistake. Now, how bad of a mistake, we won't know just yet. It depends on how it's interpreted. If it looks like it's just going to be a quarter point and that's the end of it, then probably it won't cause as much, uh, you know, damage. Uh, but it said there's no need to do this. And, and I mean, you know, inflation has been below the 2 percent target for like six or seven years now. And there's no absolutely no threat of inflation. So why what's the excuse for raising? it? I mean, it will it will push some people out of work. And uh, so that's that's a very good example of uh, something that's, you know, driven by certain ideologies and interests, a combination of these things and uh, it's it's unnecessary and it will cause damage and it will cause damage in other countries probably mm-hmm. possibly more quickly than it does here well so we're not completely free from the tyranny of the quote unquote experts yet anywhere uh, uh, Mark Weisbrot, uh thank you for writing this book thanks for coming on the program the book is failed what the experts got wrong about the global economy. Thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. Thank you.